A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Glory to you, O Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if he dies, he bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was a, th a thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death 
he, ha he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Only by undoing itself does it produce the harvest. Those are words from Archbishop Oscar Romero, speaking about the words of Jesus that we just heard read from the Gospel of John. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Like Jesus, Romero is on one level speaking quite literally about the image. When a seed is planted in the ground, it ceases to be a seed. It undoes itself, bursts its shell, sheds its husk, and becomes something new. Only by doing that, by undergoing that undoing, that transformation of what it is, does the seed fulfill its potential? Does it become what it was always meant to be? A new plant, a source of life for others. Only by undoing itself does it produce the harvest. Like Jesus, Romero was speaking quite literally about the image of the seed. And like Jesus, he is, of course, speaking about much more than that. When Jesus spoke those words about the grain of wheat, he was in the final week of his life. The religious authorities had been troubled by the level of attention he was drawing to himself. And all of this tension has come to a head in recent weeks, particularly with his raising Lazarus from the tomb. With his power over life and even death, he had become an intolerable threat to the powers that be. You see, you can do nothing, the Pharisees pathetically grumble to one another just a few verses before our reading. The world has gone after him. It's the last week of his life, and when Jesus brings up this image of a grain of wheat dying and bearing much fruit, it's pretty clear he's not only talking about farming. He's also talking about the ordeal that is ahead for him, about the undoing that is soon to come. And when Archbishop Oscar Romero read this bit of the Gospel of John in El Salvador in 1980, he also saw much more than agricultural language. Romero's home country was in the grip of a brutal military dictatorship. Those who opposed the regime were subjected to threats, torture, even death. The archbishop had been a quiet, pious priest by all reports for many years, focused on the spiritual needs of his people. Through decades of leadership, he had stayed quiet and distant from politics and public speeches, focused on what was going on inside the walls of his churches until he saw a friend and fellow priest assassinated in 1977 for his work of emboldening the poor to stand up for their dignity. After his friend's death, he began to speak openly and boldly against the violence of the regime, lifting up the names and the stories of the persons it oppressed. And when Romero encountered these verses from the Gospel of John about the grain of wheat in that context, he saw an image of the kind of costly discipleship demanded of those who aim to follow the Jesus who spoke and lived this way. These are his words. One must not love oneself so much as to avoid getting involved in the risks of life that history demands of us. Those who try to fend off the danger will lose their lives while those who out of love for Christ give themselves in love to others will live like the grain of wheat that dies, but only apparently. If it did not die, it would remain alone. Only by undoing itself does it produce the harvest. For Romero in El Salvador in 1980, the seed is a solitary human life, one that holds within it the potential to bear fruit to be life-giving for others. But it only becomes what it was always meant to be when it gives up its solitude, its protection, its present isolated form. It only grows when it sheds the safety of its shell and leaves its husk behind. It only produces the harvest when it undoes itself. 
So that's a lot to take in. How does all of that sit with you? This talk of seeds and dark earth and the new life that only comes through undoing. My guess is that it does not sound entirely appealing. Maybe it even sounds overwhelming. I don't know many people who like the idea of giving up control, of welcoming unpredictability and risk. It sounds overwhelming to me, but it also sounds like the kind of life that Jesus always offers. It seems that playing it safe was never much a value of Jesus. He had a whole lot more to say about love, which always involves the possibility of being hurt, which always involves the possibility of being changed. I don't mean, of course, that Jesus means for us to submit to abuse or oppression. Far from it. What I do mean is that life isn't there to be guarded and protected and hidden away according to the actions and the words of Jesus. It's there to be offered to others and to God. And in that offering, Jesus taught and showed again and again, we find something great, a deeper and more abundant life than we could imagine. One must not love oneself so much as to avoid getting involved in the risks of life that history demands of us, Romero said. It's scary business. So where do we find the courage for that? Here is where we find ourselves back at the cross again. You knew it was coming, right? It's where Jesus goes after all, right after these words about the grain of wheat buried in the earth. What should I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour, he says. Jesus knows that his death is coming soon, and in the Gospel of John, he walks toward it confidently, without fear, because he knows that it will not be the end of the story. Even more than that, he knows that it will be a kind of victory. Now is the judgment of this world, he says. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. Last week, we spoke about the cross as maybe the fullest expression of God's solidarity with people. God's commitment to be with us in life no matter what. That's a crucial and powerful way to understand the cross. But from the very beginning, the cross has always been more than that to Christians, more than an image of God's love alone. It has also been the place of God's decisive victory, God's triumph over death. Rowan Williams reminds us that for about the first thousand years of the Christian church, for about a thousand years after Jesus, virtually every image of the cross is a triumphant one. You don't find pictures from that time of a gruesome scene of violence or of a person suffering in agony. You find pictures of a strong figure on the cross, of a person who is unbroken by the very worst that human beings can do. Of course, the first Christians knew exactly what a crucifixion scene looked like. They knew how gruesome it was and did not need graphic artwork to remind them. But more than that, more than that, they pictured the cross in this way because for them, like for the Gospel of John, the cross was finally a symbol of victory, a symbol of hope. It was the place where God had met death in a very personal way and lived to tell the tale. Do not be afraid say the messengers who meet Jesus' followers after Easter. Do not be afraid, because death does not have the last word for Jesus or for you. That message has given courage to Christians throughout the ages. And maybe that, too, is where we find the courage to become involved in the risks of life that history demands of us. Archbishop Romero certainly knew something about that, about serving God and others with his life and accepting the risk that comes with it. I imagine others come to mind for you. I am personally thinking these days about the powerful images and stories coming from my home country, where young people, particularly from Parkland, Florida, are taking the risk of standing up and becoming involved in the conversations about gun violence. These students could very well remain individual seeds. They could stay home 
and be carefree teenagers and leave the work of creating a safer, more just society to adults. It's truly adult work, of course, but since the adults don't seem able or willing to do it, these young people are getting involved, risking the frustration of their voices not being heard, the pain that might come from meeting indifference or resistance. There they are, right in the middle of things, saying enough is enough, reminding the adults around them what courage looks like. That is what the life of following Jesus has always looked like, leaving behind a settled and predictable life for the risk of love, shedding the husk of solitary existence so that in company with Jesus, something new and fruitful might grow. That is the invitation to being a disciple. That is the calling. And yes, it is overwhelming, but we go with the promise of God. And friends, we are not alone. We go with companions by our side. We go in the steps of saints who've come before us. And most of all, we go following Jesus, who always goes before us, and whose victory is sure. Amen.